Thank you, Ron, so much for those, those kind words. Um, I, I'm really honored to be here today and, and to have a chance to share with you some of our research and, and some of our um, ideas about um, how we might be able to translate that research um, uh, toward new treatments and, and, um, and ultimately healing for um, you know, uh, our, our patients and, and children and, and parents who have struggled so mightily with this devastating um, disorder for so many years. Um, I do want to start by actually um, giving thanks to Ron for his, uh, his sheer intellectual brilliance um, and his uh, uh, ability to put together this community of blue ribbon scientists that's just you know, um, had a chance to share some of their work together over the past two days that's just been fabulous, that is um, going to be the start of, I think, um, you know, uh, real, real solutions um, uh, for, you know, for, for everyone here. And I also want to thank two other people. Um, uh, Janet, for your, your love and your, your uh, passion that is the glue that keeps us on task and, and, and unites and informs a world network of, of families that are struggling with this disease. So thank you. And then I also want to thank um, one other person, and that's their son, Whitney, whose struggles and courage have helped to galvanize this whole community um, into focusing on developing treatments and cures that make a difference that um, you know, will would be a, a bright light for all of us. So thank you all, thank you. Um, so now to the talk, uh, I'll be talking about metabolism, cell danger, healing, and ME-CFS. Um, so I'll, I'll specifically talk about a concept that we call the cell danger response. Um, I'll talk about a new concept that medicine doesn't have yet. Okay, this is kind of an important point to make, is that physicians are not taught the molecular underpinnings of the healing cycle. Um, what are the metabolic features of ME-CFS? Um, what are some of the clues from nature and these you know, uh, low, low energy persistent states that might in help inform us toward um, treatments? And what might be some future directions on approach to treatment? Okay, so when I approach problems in the laboratory, I often see them as layered, simple over complex over simple. And, and when I find myself at a layer that is particularly complex, that just causes me to double down, drill down to the next layer and find something that is, allow, that is an underlying unity okay, of that of that complexity. So there's no doubt that there is a dizzying complexity about the spectrum of ME-CFS. But I also believe there's an underlying unity. Okay. And ultimately, our research is leading us toward trying to understand the molecular underpinnings of healing and recovery. So did I have that? I hope that, that was on, so, okay. Um, so there is a, the next slide is a little disclaimer. We only study one thing in the lab, okay? It's mitochondria. But it happens to be connected to all life on the planet. In 1681, John Dryden wrote in a poem that self-defense is nature's oldest law. All of us sitting in this room here today have received genes from our ancestors that allowed them to survive every famine, every viral infection, every plague, every hard winter, until they had at least their first child from whom we descend, <laughs> okay? So we have that gene pool that allowed our ancestors to survive all of their stresses, but there are new stresses in our environment today that our ancestors had never encountered. So our genes are working with environmental changes that our ancestors never had before. And that is leading to a, a, a wave of new diseases that medicine has never seen and an increase in diseases that were very rare before. So mitochondria are you know, like canaries in the coal mine. Their metabolism is so fast 
literally they're breathing so fast that small changes in their ability to breathe actually allows them to detect stress and toxicity in the environment. So they are the regulators of cell oxygen. They're the regulators of cellular defense. This is, can't be um, overstated. Mitochondria, I'll talk about mitochondria having two roles in the cell. One is energy, one is cellular defense. Power, they conduct over 500 chemical reactions in metabolism. But when they encounter danger, they send out danger signals, okay? And these signals are received by molecular receptors on our cells that cause the cell to change its mission orders. It shifts from daily housekeeping functions, health, to defending itself. Okay, so what are some essential facts? ATP is an energy carrier that, that a lot of us, you know, have spent a lot of time with. Inside, but inside the cell, it works as um, a metabolite, the, something that, you know, that is the, cur the energy currency of the cell. But outside the cell, it doesn't do that. Outside the cell, it is a signaling molecule that says to neighboring cells, there is stress in the environment. You need to change in order to help um, uh, reduce the chances of, of, uh, of disease. So it's a, what we call a damage-associated molecular pattern or a DAMP, D-A-M-P. And again, mitochondria have two completely different functions. In my opinion, one of the um, greatest discoveries in mitochondrial biology in the, the last um, hundred years since their identification as the, uh, the seat of oxidative phosphorylation and energy production in the cell is in 2005 when they were found to be essential for coordinating the symphony of responses in innate immunity and inflammation. Okay, so mitochondria coordinate our cellular defense system. You can think of them as concert masters that work with the nucleus. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we've, we've conducted a dozen me metabolic studies over the past three years, two in autism, two in ME-CFS. We've looked at Gulf War illness, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, depression, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, exercise, aging, et cetera, and even a persistent state in worms. Why do we do that? Well, we, when we start looking at the pathways that are, that are abnormal, you can think of them as the petals on a flower, okay? And, and it turns out that when you do, you think of this as a Venn diagram, and the pathways that seem to be shared in the center are the pathways of the cell danger response, okay? So each disease is a little different, but it also has an underlying unity that's shared with MECFS and other diseases, okay? So they help to inform us about um, this underlying uh, unity. The Economist is a you know the magazine that's picked up on some of our work re um, recently, and, and um, we uh, when when our paper on metabolomics and MECFS came out last year, um, they did a little study that that looked at you know highlighted the fact that you know perhaps well that there's a real organic basis to this disease it is not just in people's heads there is a real biology behind this okay um, they also picked up our story in uh, treatment of uh, children with autism and uh, and and I'll come back to that this is a great cartoon that I really like okay that I've never had a chance to actually meet the cartoonist and if they're here today I would love to meet them okay because this came out within a within a week of the publication of our paper and it's it's a picture of you know the sleeping bear at National Institutes of Health um, uh, and you know this little scientist reaching into the cave at the, you know at, uh, and saying you can come out now there's, there's actually something we can measure in the blood that you know, shows us that this is, this is an organic, real, biological problem um, that we can begin to tackle in a rational and scientific way. Okay. All right, so now on to this, this concept of healing. So mitochondria are involved. Um, they change their function when a, when a cell is injured. And under normal circumstances, they can complete a cycle that allows us to get back to health and fitness. But if that red bar is there, boy, um, it's 
blocked. Um, so it leads us to this organizing concept of you know, what causes, why do people remain sick for a long time? We believe that the reason is they've encountered roadblocks to healing that prevent them from getting well. Okay? And that that can be tackled in a scientific and a rational way. So failure to complete the healing cycle. Um, so if you look at health on the left, all those different lines um, leading to injury, that red box on the right, um, are different types of injuries, cuts, scrapes, infections, trauma, toxins, okay? And they all produce different paths to this cellular, this cellular state of injury. Now, evolutionary selection wasn't able to predict all the different ways that you can injure a cell, but it was able to select a way to get back to health. So the cell does not just retrace the path that led to the illness, okay? It uses a different path of molecular events to restore healing, okay? And so what we found is that the cell danger response consists of three sequential steps in, in healing that each are governed by a transition or a checkpoint that has to be released before the next stage of healing can be entered. Okay? And so if you're blocked at a point, then you cannot complete the healing cycle. So if that CDR, the red block, um, if you can treat that red block, and it turns out one of the steps is actually amenable to um, a particular new class of drugs that we call antipurinergic drugs, and if you release that, then the healing cycle can progress, okay? can proceed. All right. So, so a lot of time, we've spent a lot of time, this is something that, that, you know, the whole community of scientists has really spent a great deal of time in trying to understand what genes predispose to ME-CFS. What kinds of trauma, what kinds of viruses, fungi, um, what kind of abnormalities are there in the immune system? T, B, and NK cells, mitochondria, enzymes in mitochondria, pesticide solvents, um, cytokines. Well, we're starting to think of those as different ways of ringing the same bell and that really what might be um, a unifying way of thinking of things is that there is a, a unified cellular response to those stresses. Okay. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go past this. Pardon? Because um, I don't want to... Um, I just want to introduce this con the concept of you know, what we're measuring with metabolomics. So when we take a drop of blood, a sample of blood, we're sampling from a, um, a, a river or ocean ecosystem that contains all the nutrients and resources that a cell needs and all the waste products that it produces. Okay? So it's a mix of the collective conversations of all the cells in our body and our microbiome okay? is, is actually registered in our blood. And so when we, so we have that microcosm um, that we analyze with a, a mass spec that's a half million dollar machine. This is not an easy thing. It's not a, um, a turnkey operation yet. Um, but scientists from around the world are, are working to make it so. And this is just a, 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 a slide that shows that we can um, separate the you know, healthy patients from patients with chronic fatigue using metabolomics. And, and then I'll finish with a couple slides on um, natural low energy states in, in um, uh, nature. So it turns out Lyme and tuberculosis and many other different bacterial pathogens can adopt a low energy state that makes them resistant to antibiotics. Okay? That's a persistent state. If you try to treat under those conditions, then they're virtually immune to the antibiotic. But once they exit and begin metabolizing again, then they can be treated. Um, many mammals will use a, a, a phenomenon called diapause, which is uh, where fertilization occurs in the fall, the embryo develops and plants in the, the, the uterus, for, um, but stops until just before um, spring, when it uh, when growth is renewed, and um, <laughs> okay, so hibernation, torpor, estivation, tune, um, 
Dower, these are all different stages, even caloric restriction and longevity research. These are all different ways of inducing decreases in mitochondrial metabolism and alterations in mitochondrial function that um, can allow the organism to survive a hostile environment for a longer period of time. But it is not a happy survival, okay? And in the case of MECFS, you know, um, this leads to, to years of, of suffering. So um, I'll just think I'm going to, I'm going to, because, uh, so, so we've done two studies, a discovery set and a validation set. The validation study is in progress right now. The Open Medicine Foundation is, you know, the funder for this, and I, I'm very grateful for this. But it's bringing together many scientists in our, in, in um, in order to, to help uh, really drill down and focus on the things that we can measure in the blood um, that give us insight to the biology of the disease. And I, I'm going to give this one last slide and then we'll finish. So many of you know that we also work in autism. Um, we've just conducted a small clinical trial, a phase one um, clinical trial, uh, using a drug that is the first of its kind, a representative of one of those antipurinergic drugs that, re that removes the roadblock at one particular stage in the healing cycle. Um, and this is how it works. So we used a low dose of serumin that is previously, it's a hundred year old drug that's been used to treat sleeping sickness. <laughs> but to test this idea that autism is of dysfunction of cells. So here's a picture of a, a neuron. You can think of this as any different cell type in the, in the body. Um, uh, and mitochondria are, will make ATP and energy, but that ATP can be released through channels, okay, in the membrane. And it can bind to then receptors on that membrane to signal cell stress. And they go into survival mode, okay, a different form of metabolism. Now what about treatment? If you use a drug that's capable of blocking the, the, the loss of ATP from the cell, then even without changing the mitochondrial function, you've improved the ability of the cell um, to use that ATP for, health, for, for, um, for healing and growth. So I think that might actually just be, I'll end with that. So. Um, Oh, so, so this is a, one, way of, one way that we're approaching um, treatment is to remove, first if there's a trigger, a, a stress that's still in the environment, that we try to remove that. Another is to use this new lens to, to be able to guide us um, in therapies. And this will have to be a, um, you know, a way of, of restoring, finding, finding where the, the the nutritional um, holes are, um, the weaknesses, and, uh, and, and trying to, to tailor treatment individually. And then, and then when clinical trials become available, we'll actually start trying to, to uh, use the signaling function to remove roadblocks in, in healing to see if that actually makes a difference in, uh, in MECFS. And so I'll end there, and thank you very much.